What I'm going to do is I'm going to give a short talk about uh, two things really, to try and take you back to the summer and the events of the unrest in London and other cities um, as a kind of touchstone for our sociological imaginations, if you like, um, and to talk about some issues that were, were generated out of those events which connected the question of unrest. Um, but, but perhaps even more importantly, or as importantly, um, I want to try and also uh, raise some questions about how we might conduct, if you like, um, not just the public, or a discussion about the public image of sociology, but how we might conduct sociology in public. Yeah. So a slight distinction between those two things, and some experiments that I've, I've been involved in with colleagues at Goldsmiths, particularly Caroline Mark. Knowles and also Alison Rook. Okay, so the thing is, I think that Mike picks up very importantly at the beginning uh, of his, his, com his comments is that, you know, we're living in a moment where, you know, digital culture is transforming social life. It is also transforming the nature and quality of observation and of telling society. Yeah. One of the things that really caught my imagination during the, the, the summer um, that's passed, was the degree to which the young people involved in the unrest that was going on on the streets of, of London were recording their experience, their witness, in real time through their smartphones and then broadcasting it almost simultaneously. Um, this YouTube clip is from a JD Sports at the end of my street. So the strange kind of um, effect that this produced was some, a place that was very familiar, then suddenly encountering it, you know, on the computer screen, being and, and of a moment being observed, and at a particular context being observed. So I'm not going to say any more about it, I'm just going to play you. Who's that? Yeah, no, I ain't touching like that. I was just whipping it yesterday. Uh, I was there yesterday as well. Who thinks that this is fucking crazy? Not saying anything. I'm a working man. I can't. Like, I would love to go out there. I ain't gonna lie, but I can't do that. They are taking the fucking shit. It's going off in Hackney now, you know. Some of these people look about four. Oh, listen, I would love to go up in there. Lad, you've got trainers. I cannot believe. Look, this boy looks about four. I would love to fucking have a kid. I work with children. I need to protect my CRB at all times. Yeah, I can't. But what the fuck? Hey, Brixton yesterday was not the clean dark curry, but I'm telling you. Um. There was something about that, I don't know, I think maybe it, it, it was partly it kind of caught my imagination because it was such a local familiar scene, and some of those kids I see every day on roller skates. Um, but the other thing that really caught my imagination was it, all, it, it seemed like there was a kind of division being staged in front of JD Sports. You know, a division between those who had more to lose and those who had less to lose. And it's not to romanticise, I don't think, those events, or to or kind of, kind of politicise them in a crude way. But there's something about that distinction that I want to sort of come back to in, in my comments. Now, with the discourse that we that we heard so much of at the time was of these events being pure criminality. But of course, we know uh, more than most, the idea of pure criminality in itself makes no sense in the context of any sociology of crime. But this is the other thing. I'm sure many of you heard, uh, heard will remember these words by Boris with his broom in Clapham. He didn't say these words in, in, um, uh, when the photograph was taken. He said, it's time we stopped hearing all these, you know, Nonsense. 
with you know, this you know, nonsense about how the, there are deep sociological justifications for wanton criminality and destruction of people's property. Whatever people's grievance may be, it does not justify smashing up someone's shop, wrecking their livelihood, and kicking them out of the job. I mean, I suppose the thing that I wanted just to sort of use this as a touchstone, really, is to, is to think about the way, as a perception in public, if you like, of sociological understanding, and the conflation of that with justification. Excuses, as Theresa May commented. I'm sure some of you will know and remember that um, Tim Newburn at the LSE was involved in a, in a report called Reading the Riots. I don't want to talk about the report too much, but it was basically interviewing those people who'd been involved and been prosecuted um, during those events. Um, now, maybe this is going to be on Tim Newman's impact statement, but when it was report, when the report was um, launched, Theresa May went to the launch. She went to the launch to hear what was going on, and then she documented this difficult and painful experience in the Daily Mail. Let me just read you a few passages from what she said. Last week, I went to the London School of Economics, the School of Economics, to the conference held to discuss the findings of a study into the causes of the August riots. Despite knowing I would be heckled, and notwithstanding the excuses I knew I would hear that everyone but the criminals themselves were to blame, that it was this government's fault, it was this government's fault, and the police and the society, I was determined to attend. Keep, keep that image of the JD Sports in mind. She says, part of the account that's offered by Tim Newburn and his colleagues is that many of the people involved and were arrested had already got criminal records. So we know, she says, that actually they weren't trying to make any political, political or social statement. They were thieving pure and simple. On average, each rioter was ch charged had 11 previous offences. In other words, they were career criminals. One rioter interviewed by the academics said the police are always causing us hell. In my role as Home Secretary, I can only say, good. There's lots of things going on about the deployment of, you know, perhaps predictably conservative politicians, either reducing to the kind of things that we might want to try and do in our craft to either justification or excuses for bad stuff, for criminality, for bad behaviour, you know, and the kind of moral weakness, I suppose, from the point of view of the conservative politicians of our discourse. But there's something else that I think um, I want to sort of reflect on. And then in a way, there's just a couple of quick points I want to, I want to make before taking you to these other kind of spaces um, where the sort of meaning, interpretation, significance <coughs> of these events were also being debated. We know from, from the Newburn report that you know, the sort of social backgrounds of those people involved was perhaps more much more complicated than the media representation. But there's the work that Avery Gordon is doing on incarceration and the role of the prison in society, I think, is something that made me think again about how important, perhaps, the distinctions that are kind of unfolding in front of that JD Sports are, are becoming, are, and maybe increasingly are becoming, to young people. Avery points out, you know, almost everywhere in all times, poor and people of colour, ethnic and religious minorities, migrants and dissidents are overrepresented in prisons. So moving into a, I was talking to John about this this morning, he said something that really cool, stuck in my mind, saying, you know, for young people now, the choice, there are two, you know, debt is obviously something we've talked about a lot in terms of the change of higher education, but you know, so many young people find themselves in the criminal justice system and in prison. 2010, black prisoners made up 15% of the population, 2.2% of the general population. You know, just in crude statistical terms, that means there's a great disproportionality in the number of black people in prison in the UK than there are in the United States. We just took you know, a sort of racialized distinction. 
as one example. Craig Haney, who's another interesting figure I've been reading a lot lately, makes this really chilling prediction that perhaps we're moving to a kind of social order, a new social order, where there are three reformed and dependent classes of person. There's a prison class, housing a network of prisons, people who go in and out of prison, a class of jailers, and then a service class, a network of professionals, of administrative, administrative elites who decide into which of the previous two they get placed. But that kind of, that scene in front of the JD sport, you know, those who have something to hold on to, those who have nothing to lose, those who are kind of periodically in and, in and out uh, of prison or connected to the prison of uh, criminal justice system in a crude way. Is that going to be the plight of the generation who will come of age now? Um, so that was my kind of reflective point about the unrest and the riots and, and division, I suppose. But what we tried to do in, in the aftermath of these events, largely by a kind of accident, is to, is to rather than think to do that kind of linear idea of, of impact or knowledge transfer, what we thought, partly as a kind of accident, would be interesting to embrace the opportunities to have a different kind of dialogue in public not with Theresa May, but with young constituencies of young people locally. There's a fantastic radio station very close to Goldsmiths College called Represent. And there are a series of, of, um, of radio programs that were made, sometimes broadcasting during those events, about issues of unemployment. And the first one that I went on um, was, was on the 22nd, 22nd of August. And it kind of, from there it evolved into a whole series of really wonderful occasions where you had young people, packed rooms of young people, middle-aged academics like me, um, postgraduate students like some of you, um, along with teachers um, and people involved in, in art um, and cultural initiatives. It's a really interesting experiment with doing kind of sociological thinking differently. There's another um, another example um, I just wanted to show you some images of so you could get a sense of the, co the context and the quality of those rooms there's a sixth form college very close to, to Goldsmiths where there are 300 students studying AS and A level sociology one place partly because there's a fantastic very sort of charismatic teacher there so over a period of the last two years we kind of hold an academic conference in the school. And this is a photograph of not this year's but last year's. And basically how the, how the event runs. People could invite to come and give speeches. The students write questions in response to, this, to what they've heard. They come up onto the stage um, and ask the questions. And then the kind of dialogue unfolds from there. The best questions get a book as a prize. Very simple format. It's a fantastic. I mean, what's so extraordinary about it is how long the students stay. They stay all day. Sometimes refuse to go home. Um, this is you can't really see it very well, um, but that's Les Henry. He was a former PhD student at Goldsmiths. Well, um, perhaps we'll talk a little bit about about this and how it unfolds. But what was really interesting for, for me was not only what. Um, what came out of the discussion, but a sort of kind of, they became almost events in which there was a sort of reckoning with, a reckoning with what had happened, and a kind of, um, a circulation of those sort of folk ideas, we might characterise them in our discourse, as well as some theoretical ideas that they learned from their A-level sociology textbooks, as well as the best guesses of the researchers who were also there trying to make sense of what had happened. I'll stop there, actually, otherwise we'll... I'll take up the time.